Good morning. My name is Lance French. I'm the Business Development Manager for WM Environmental, a division of Braun Intertech, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar on industrial and construction stormwater permitting. Our experts for today are Braun Intertech. We have somebody from Braun Intertech, all the way from Minnesota. Uh, Amanda, <laughs> Amanda Bergstrom, thank you for joining us, Amanda. And for the third time this year, I guess um, I didn't realize that uh, Nick Foreman, uh, WM's own Nick Foreman. So, Nick, thank you for being here. I can't say no. Again, you have. I obviously have a way with you. So, <laughs> uh, so thanks for joining us. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. If you guys have any questions, uh, send them to us through the chat tab on your go to what webinar window. If we don't get your question, I will make sure that Amanda and Nick sees them and get an answer to you as soon as possible. We are recording this webinar and it will be available to rewatch on our website soon along with the slides. And we will send you guys an email with the link when they're made available. Okay, so let's get to it. So I want to introduce you to Amanda. She is with been with Braun Intertech. How long have you been with Braun Intertech? Just a few months. All right. Man, I got you, <laughs> I got you fresh, fresh. Yeah. So well, we really appreciate you. She's from our Bloomington office and from Braun. Uh, she has a bachelor in geoengineering and geoenvironmental emphasis uh, from University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And she has 16 experience in water resources, uh, engineering focus on stormwater modeling, BMP design and permitting. And so just so you guys know, that is not a beaver, it is a gopher. So Yeah, we're in Bucky's country down yeah, here, so that's for, definitely a I gopher. I said it was. A, it looked like a beaver yesterday, and it didn't go well. But And then we also know that don't ask her anything about sports teams because she, she we went through this yesterday, she doesn't know, and it was actually quite embarrassing. So we're not even going to bring that up anymore. <laughs> Welcome, Amanda. Yeah, <laughs> I know that it's Goldie Gopher. Yeah, <laughs> All right, Goldie very gopher. good. No, we're really, really, really glad you're here. So, And, and Nick Foreman, uh, again, for the third time, uh, so you guys probably know Nick really well. Uh, he has a BS in biology from no other than Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a master's in public health, uh, also from Texas A&M. So mm -hmm. and he's had 13 years with w &M, focusing on industrial stormwater, uh, water permitting and compliance, spill prevention, control, SPCCs, and uh, EPCRA reporting. I don't even know what that is, but we're not even going to get to that. So and then. <laughs> So you guys know that that is not just Nick's dog. That is actually uh, one of the hundred Aggie mascots that they have. No, it's Reveille. It's our main ask I mascot. Know, well, okay. So that's Reveille. So, <laughs> and why it's a collie, we don't really know. But you can you can send Nick a question on that. So, okay, let's get to it. So our agenda today is we're, uh, the purposes for the stormwater uh, prevent, pollution prevention, and we're just going to call them SWIPs from here on out because it's easier to say. Yeah, it is um, There are many types of SWIP permits, and we're going to be focusing um, mainly on the industrial and the construction um, and the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're going to have some question and answer time, but uh, we do encourage you to uh, send in your questions, um, and our moderator, Lydia, will let us know when we have them. And um, try to stump you so stump the experts oh, no. so, but uh we've been through this three times i gotta say that these these two know their stormwater uh regulations so it's, it's actually pretty impressive i would call them nerds but i don't know if that's oh, we're appropriate nerds. Yeah. but you know what if you are a nerd if you love being called a nerd so take it away nerd there all you right. go all right so uh stormwater is something that's um if you're an environmental list in general an environmental consultant stormwater is everywhere right it's it's a requirement in every state. It's a requirement in EPA. Um, one thing that we, I do want to m mention before we really get going here is we have more and more states listening to these webinars. Um, before it was really kind of Texas centric and or specifically where the training was being done. Now that we are nationwide, we have a broad belt going all the way up through the middle of the United States. We're focusing more on the EPA version of permits and so we're going to focus on the epa versions of the multi-sector multi-sector sector general permit and the epa version of the construction general permit but how we got here um so in 1969 the cuyahoga cuyahoga river caught on fire not once but this was the 12th time the cuyahoga river caught on fire the first 11 times apparently was fine no big deal yeah who cares, who cares? it's just the cuyahoga That's river odd. right yeah so 
Um, the twelfth time was the straw that broke the camel's back, right? And it really started a an environmental revolution. Um, you'll see here this is 1969. The very next year, EPA was assigned and it was created as an agency. So this really did start what um, what we now know as the environmental revolution. When when the New York Times covered this and one of the articles that I read, um, they said that this this river oozed instead of flowed. So that's kind of kind of creepy. Man, that's weird. Yeah. So um, in response to this. Not only this incident, but this is finally, like I said, the straw that broke the camel's back. The the water, the Clean Water Act of 1972 was established, and it was really that the intent of it was really to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of our nation's waters. It had gotten so bad that the government had to step in and say, "Hey, we need to we need to get this under control and restore our waters to back to the clean water that we we had had before." And so what they initially started focusing on in 1972 was point sources. So what we historically or currently think about today as wastewater coming out of a pipe is what they really just really focused on. So in 1987, uh, the Water Quality Act was added, um, or I guess they added Section 402P, and the um, that enabled the EPA to establish the in PDES, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination Systems. I'm going to be lazy and call that Nipodes. Um, in Texas, we call it Tipides. This is the Nipodes, all right? So um, in 1972, that was um, put into act. And, and as you, if you go to the next slide, you'll see here that it took three years for them to um, establish a non-point source um, component to the permitting, right? So phase one of the Nipodes was um, or in, in, re, in regards to industrial stormwater was focusing on large MS4s, the municipal, um, separate, municipally separate storm sewer systems. That's another mouth, mouthful, so I'm going to call it an MS4. Mm -hmm. um, so large MS4s with populations over 100,000 um, and large construction sites and then industrial activities um, that were non-point sources is what that focused on. And then phase two in 1999, that's whenever you started, um, they started including MS4s with towns and cities that are less than 100,000 people in population, and then small construction activities between one and five acres in size. So that's that's how we got to where we are today. Thank you. Hey, no sweat. So, and this is, you know, down here in Texas, this isn't really an issue for us. Um, we have a couple days of snow a year and it's not it's kind of an afterthought right we haven't even had snow in dallas it's for three like years. five yeah, yeah maybe three or five yeah corpus had more snow than we did the last two years so go figure right so um just an fyi runoff can be rainfall or it can be snow melt as well that's obviously more of the you know the, the northern states and that kind of stuff but we wanted to remind people that just because it's snow on your property whenever that melts you can also but it's so pretty it is so pretty right so um, and this is, if, if you don't get anything from this presentation, and we hope you do, don't get me wrong, <laughs> you should, <laughs> but if you don't get, anything. You don't get anything else, um, we want you to re remember that stormwater is not treated. Um, what leaves your facility um, will ultimately end up in a water body, and you can't rely on these two cute girls, my, my little girls here, um, to clean up after yourself. So whatever leaves your property, that's your responsibility. So it's best to keep it on your property and find ways to minimize exposure. Okay, so like like Lance mentioned, there's a there's a handful of different stormwater permits, right? Okay, so we're going to focus on the first two, the industrial multi-sector general permit, we'll call it the MSGP, and then the construction stormwater permit, right? So and we'll call that the construction general permit, the GCP, CGP, sorry. And then, uh, so on the industrial side, um, about 85 to 90% of industry is covered under the MSGP. So um, if you don't meet those requirements, then you have to go and get an industrial or an individual industrial wastewater or water quality discharge permit. Um, the difference between the two on the MSGP side, you get to, um, th that's pre-described or prescribed um, conditions that you have to meet. If you have to get an individual permit, you can kind of tailor it to your property. It's a lot more expensive. It's a lot more time consuming. And typically the, um, the 
the regulating agency is going to have a lot more for you to do than you can think of um, on your own. So, um, but if you can't meet the requirements, then you can get an individual permit. And then for cities or municipalities or college campuses that act like cities, um, you can also get a, you need to get a municipal separate storm sewer system. And that's how a large population of people handles their water. Does it go to drainage ditches on the side of the highway that go to catchment basins and then to, you know, water bodies, that kind of, that kind of information, how they make sure that they they have clean water as well. Okay, so um, we talked about four different permits there. It gets really confusing here, right? So um, the EPA has their permit, and that's kind of the the base template or the or the base for what other states can or what states can do, right? <clears throat> but where it gets hairy is that not every state is delegated the authority to have their own. Um, like in Texas, it's the Tipides, the Texas Pollution Discharge Elimination System, and in other states, they have their own regulating agency. So not every state gets that authority, and not every state should have that authority, in all honesty. Um, but so it's important to contact your state, contact the EPA, contact your consultants of choice, hopefully Braun and WM. But uh, it's important to make sure that you're abiding by the correct uh, permit. So we've got some links here that can help you figure that out. And um, there's also a couple websites that we can send out as well that um, can help you make sure you're looking at the correct permit. Um, and then obviously some some of these states have partial authority, and we'll show you the next slide here. Um, but some of them are only for tribal lands, like so tribal tribal uh, authorities will have their own. Um, stormwater permit that's more conservative and more restrictive than what the EPA says. So this is this is kind of a joke that we have here. Um, this is confusing to us. So the EPA says we we are going to delegate authorization to certain states to do this, and then they give you this map, and I can't make heads or tails out of it. And so, like I said, the the, the moral of the story here. Check with your consultant, check with your state, check with the EPA and make sure you're looking at the right permit. That joke is hilarious, by the yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> we thought it was, okay. but yes. we had to be there. If you're trying to make sense out of it, it's a joke. It is. <laughs> so there are several types of pollutants that stormwater can pick up at a site. Some are obvious like trash and debris, but many of them are not as well known. So um, I've listed a few here. So sediment and dust are really big ones. Leaves and organics are are big, not everywhere, but in Minnesota, it's a, it's a really big deal. Um, your petroleum products and chemicals, pesticides, fertilizers, metals, and another big one in the Midwest is road salt. Um, we've got a lovely picture there of a pile of salt, which was obviously not distributed um, appropriately, <laughs> and that will end up in the downstream water body. So we have uh, some issues with chloride pollution in our lakes that the MPCA is currently trying to figure out how to solve because it's very difficult to remove. So um, most of those things make sense, oils, antifreeze, gasoline, chemicals, pesticides, but leaves and organics, that seems, uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily cast, classify that as a, as a pollutant. So Right. And in, if you go to some place like Hawaii, as I've done before, they don't really regulate that and they're not worried about it. But um, Minnesota, because we have a lot of trees um, and uh, so that's a, a large source of phosphorus. Uh -huh. And so when you have a lot of phosphorus getting into your lakes, you're going to have algal blooms and uh, too much algal growth is going to um, reduce your dissolve, dissolved oxygen in the in the water. So fish have a hard time breathing. So it becomes a problem hmm. for your fisheries and it affects that's how you get impairments. So a lot of our impairments in Minnesota are based on phosphorus. Okay, so. well, there's my one thing I got out of the, the <laughs> webinar. So. You get an A for the day. And you need yeah. to make sure, it, what I really want you to know is when you mow your lawn, uh, don't leave your grass clippings and your leaves in the street where the stormwater is going to pick it up and bring it downstream. So a lot of people don't know that. So. Okay. okay. Shameless plug for the watershed districts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, obviously you have to meet the requirements of these permits. And so uh, on the industrial side, so I guess let me let me back up just a second. This is kind of where Amanda and I are going to start playing verbal ping pong. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be I will be talking on the industrial side, making sure um, that I cover the industrial requirements and contents of this web, and she'll be covering the construction side. So when you hear me talking, if you have an industrial site, 
you know, listen to me talking. Whenever Amanda's talking, she's talking construction. And I want to also point that just because you have one doesn't mean you can't have the other. So we have a handful of sites that are industrial facilities and while they want to add a wing to their facility, so they need a construction permit. We had a client probably a year ago saying, hey, we're doing an expansion. Um, and they asked if we needed a SWIFT and I told them, no, we already have one. I was like, back <laughs> uh, call them back and say no you need one or we can help do one whatever it is it's a completely different permit with completely different objectives so um, just because you have one doesn't mean you can't have the other so on the industrial SWIP permitting app applicability side um, it basically boils down to what operations you're doing at your facility so the EPA permit and most of the TC or most of the state permits dictate what, um, whether or not you're covered based on the SIC code, the standard standard industrial, standard industrial code. Um, it's an outdated system, but they still use it. Um, it whatever your SIC code was, is that draws you into this permit. So there's a handful of um, types of activities that the EPA really covers, and we'll show you that in a minute, just so you can have reference to it. But um, you reference the SIC code within the permit, and then it'll tell you what sector you're in, right? So if you... Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, good. So if, <laughs> you go, Lance. <laughs> so the so if you have a, a, a SIC code, it's still the same permit, but different categories, or, or? right. So if you have, um, so if you fall into one of the SIC codes for the MSGP, you can qualify for that permit as long as you meet the requirements for that permit. Now, what it does though is it breaks down into sectors, and so certain sectors have certain additional requirements but it's still under the same MSGP. Okay, so um, so the, the main thing is, is if you have stormwater discharge and if you, are, are, if you fall under one of these SIC codes, unless you meet the no exposure exclusion, and that's generally you don't have operations outdoors, you're not storing equipment outdoors, you're not doing maintenance outdoors, you're not transloading, you're not offloading materials outdoors. Um, if you can meet the requirements from the EPA and the state, whichever applies to you, then you can apply for a no exposure certification. And that obviously gets you out, uh, I was gonna say it's get, get you out of the permit, but it, it overrides the NOI and you can have an NUC. Ugh. Oh yeah, so this is the one that we, we said, this is the wall of words, this is Lance's favorite slide. <laughs> um, this, this is the 11 categories that the EPA breaks down the SIC codes into and um, if you fall into one of these categories, more than likely you're gonna end up with the MSGP. Obviously, I'm not gonna cover it all, but whenever you get the slides that Lance sends out, make sure you take a look at it. And if you have any questions, give us a holler. And then with the construction general permit, um, you trigger that when you disturb one or more acres of land, or if you have a site that is smaller than an acre, but it is part of a larger common development that is greater than an acre. There aren't a lot of uh, exceptions or, or um, waivers, but I know here in Texas, there is a low erosivity waiver certification that you can, uh, you can apply for, where if you can demonstrate your erosivity factors less than five during a construction activity. If you want more details on that, I, <laughs> I, I know a few, I've looked into it, but I haven't seen that in Minnesota. Um, and then there's another condition that if, um, particularly with a public agency, if you're responding to a, an emergency of some sort, um, you can apply for your uh, notice of intent within 30 days. So you can go ahead and, and proceed with your your activity without being, and with being yeah. covered. Nope, sorry, I can't help you. I don't have my construction <laughs> swift. <laughs> right, right, right. So no one asks questions when the road is blown out. You just need to fix it. So, right. so man, how, how soon um, in the process do you need to get your uh, construction swept? I mean, I mean, is it, it obviously before construction, but I mean, well, after planning or part of the planning or? Ideally, uh, you would want to have that SWIP developed prior to breaking ground and you absolutely are not supposed to break ground until you have your your um, your permit in hand. Okay. So, but um, if you, if you um, go to the next slide, oh, I don't have it here. Well, um, we'll talk a little bit more later about those requirements as to what you need to have and when. Okay. Um, so yeah. we'll get into yeah. that. Okay, so this this is a, an introductory slide to what we're going to be doing for the next probably 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is. Um, maybe a little longer if Lance Ugh. doesn't shove a fork <laughs> in my thigh. Um, 
the what we've done is we've gone through the industrial and the construction swoop and we've kind of laid them out side by side and we found some commonalities and and some differences and we lumped them into these categories so each of our next you know 10 or 12 slides are going to be covering these criteria what's applicable to the construction the construction permit and what's applicable to the industrial permit so this is just a introductory we'll and we'll touch each of these buckets and we'll start with the permit registration. So this isn't necessarily the first thing you have to do, but on the permitting side of things, this is, the, this is what gets the ball rolling on the permitting side of things. So um, with the industrial SWIFT, you have to submit an NOI, an, a notice of intent, and that's giving the regulatory agency the warm fuzzies that you intend to meet the requirements of their, of their permit. So it's a notice of intent. You intend to do what they're asking you to do, right? So um, if, if, it's, if this is around the, the rollover of the new permit or something like that, um, there are a lot of deadlines as to when you're supposed to submit your, su submit your NOI. Since the permit was last updated in 2015 for the EPA, I'm not gonna cover that right now because it's not really applicable. Um, but if you are a new discharger, um, it's supposed to be 30 days before discharge. I know in Texas, it's a little bit shorter. I think it's, um, it may even be the day before. Um, I'd have to check that um, off memory. But um, just know that you are supposed to get it done before you have any industrial activity and stormwater discharging from your site. So that's the big thing. Also, um, and this is why I'm really glad that TCEQ has their own permit as opposed to the EPA permit, but you're supposed to make, uh, according to the EPA MSGP, you're supposed to make your uh, your SWIP publicly available. So you either have to download a copy to a website and provide that URL so that the EPA can share that, or you're supposed to basically copy and paste your entire SWIP and put it in the NOI in the, in, in the pre-described categories that they give you. So um, in Texas, I know you just kind of have to make it available if anyone asks. So Nick, um, are you allowed to transfer a, a SWIP like from one company? Let's say that you know I have a SWIP and I'm selling my property, and I can say, hey, I already got a stormwater permit. Yeah. But so generally speaking, no. Um, so we, certain things you can change about a permit, and that's a notice of change, right? So if, say you have a new chemical or a new process on your site that changes your pollutants of concern, then you can submit an NOC and say, hey, this is our change. But if you actually have a change in ownership, you need to do a notice of termination to terminate that permit and, and apply for a new permit with an NOI. Oh, very good. Yeah. So the other thing here is the no exposure certification. I know I mentioned it earlier, but if you meet the requirements, um, and generally speaking, the EPA and the state requirements for an NEC are pretty similar. Um, I know some of them have a little bit different, but uh, then then you can submit that in lieu of an NOI. And then with the construction permit, um, the EPA uses an e-reporting tool called NET. So if you're using that permit, that's where you'll use it. Otherwise, you'll use your state's um, online submittal process. Uh, with the EPA, it's a minimum of 14-day waiting period before issue uh, or before coverage is issued. But uh, many states, like Minnesota, offer within one day once the payment is received. Um, and back to kind of those small construction waivers, that's also the time where you would apply for that, the low erosivity waiver. There are a couple of other examples TM, related to TMDLs. There's an equivalent analysis waiver. And then again, um, with the emergency response situation, uh, I mentioned you, as long as you get your notice of intent in within 30 days of the activity, you're, you're essentially covered. Um, another aspect, at least in Minnesota, and one of these um, important differences sometimes between the EPA permit and a state permit. In Minnesota, if you have a, a site that is greater than 50 acres and you're discharging to a special or impaired water that is with one within a mile of your site, you're going to have to submit your SWIP and your plans for review. And the, the MPCA in this case is our agency, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and you have they have 30 days to review it. So that can hold up your project if you're not aware of that. That's why it's good to look into those things. And I'll address um, Lance's question about transferring permits. That's actually a very common thing to do in construction because a lot of times you might have a land developer who might be the owner. They might transfer to a general contractor or they might start, um, you know, they might have a bunch of lots that they're developing and future owners, they'll transfer to them. So it's a pretty simple process, luckily. So Now, what about, um, like, when you're in 
construction, there's a hard end date, or you would hope. Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> there's an initial. There's end date, a, yes. So, but at, so let's say after after uh, your construction is done, do you have to apply for an, another SWIP, or is there a, a an after the construction SWIP is over? Yep. So once you've finalized uh, your final, I guess your permit or final stabilization and your your know, landscaping, um, you would continue inspections under your permit until your vegetation has reached the density that's required and. I'll just note um, some of the native species that you plant have lower expectations as to what's um, acceptable because they do take up to three years to germinate. So um, essentially, once your vegetation reaches that um, that level, then you can file for your notice of So you'd be under a construction slope for up to three plus years? Well, hopefully not. Um, but that's, I mean, that's kind of the concern with using natives, which is where we're, we're struggling in Minnesota a little bit on that. And uh, MnDOT, MnDOT is working hard to figure out some mixes that are going to show enough growth to be acceptable because you just don't want wide open areas of, mm. of soil. Um, and another thing, you know, we're kind of going through this right now is to frozen conditions. I know you guys don't deal with that much here, but what's what, this we did last week? Yeah. Speak of right. <laughs> last week, it got cold. Yeah, yeah. It was so almost thirty. There, obviously, you're not going to be growing anything, so you're going to want to just have a ninety percent coverage of your mulch, and we call that just stabilizing the site, stabilizing your soils, and then you know deciding whether you want to suspend inspections until you resume again. So there's a lot of differences there, and very specific to each state and condition, and even within yeah. a state. So, yeah. In addition to that, too, Lance, I know you asked about the end date. So if you go past your end date or you realize that your construction, you know, phase one is going six months long because you had a frozen condition or whatever it is, you can, as long as you keep, you, you submit an NOC. Is that N-O-T, the term? Notice of N-O-T. termination. N-O-T, well, or, but this is so oh, say you're extending your 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 end date, right? Mm-hmm. Do you at least in Texas you have to go back and say, okay, we initially thought we were going to be done in. April, but we're going to be done in July now, so we just have to let the TC. And ironically, mm-hmm. most of the time is because of rain. Yeah. Because we got too much rain, and you can't build when it rains. At least here we can. At least that's what they say. Yeah. yeah. You're not All trying right. hard enough. All right. So there's two things I've learned. Man, this is a very informative <laughs> webinar. Yeah, you're gonna have to tap out here soon, man. <laughs> oh, yay! I just smile and nod from here on out. So. <clears throat> Okay, so this this is actually fairly similar between the two per, um, permits. Um, you have to do an evaluation on whether or not your processes and your discharges are going to impact endangered water, endangered species, or historical places. So um, there, I, I I could go into like five slides of this, and Lance would hate me, and we could do this, but I would just say that there's very specific processes outlined in the permits that say. If you identify that you discharge into <clears throat> an impaired water body, then you need to do this. And it will be either contact the state agency, it'll be contact the EPA. Um, basically, so this information also gets submitted with your NOI. And so when you submit this to the NOI, that's a red flag for the TCEQ or the EPA, whoever it is, to, um, to know that you are going to be discharging into an impaired water body or near a historic place. So. There's at that point, if you are one of those facilities that does discharge into an impaired water body, then you have to figure out what you need to monitor for, what you have to sample for, or what you are, you know, certain things you like, excuse me, if you know that you are, the water body is impaired for a certain class of chemicals, and there's no way that you have that on your property, you just kind of have to document that, but they will ask you to provide documentation that you don't have, that you don't have that on property. And then I'll just point out a couple of things because um, ex- the way these these two issues um, impact these two permits, one is for existing facilities typically, and for construction it can be new new site development. So if you are clearing and grubbing trees, you may need to have a tree survey done um, for the northern long eared bat. That's one that I've seen many times. Uh, and then the rusty patch bumblebee, there's a range map that can be used to um, to determine your impacts there. And those are just kind of newer within maybe the last five years or so, something like that. Um, and then you hopefully wouldn't have to do an archaeological survey, but it's possible. I've seen it happen before. So that can definitely hold things up. So if you have archaeology in addition to the historical places, you might. And it's expensive. Yeah. So those are <laughs> things you usually want to look into while you're developing your SWIP prior to wanting to break ground so that you can plan when you should, you know, clear and grub and and make sure your surveys are done at the right time of the year. 
So you've been gathering information this whole time now, and you've submitted your NOI, and <clears throat> before you even submit your NOI, you're supposed to be developing your SWEP with the information that you're gathering, right? So the good thing is, uh, on the on the industrial side and on the construction side, the content that goes into these permits is pretty similar. Um, you have to have um, a, a site description, what's going to be happening, when's it going to be happening. You have to have a map that shows where you're storing areas, where you're going to be laid out, you're laying down equipment, um, and, 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 and keep all that information in one centralized place, right? So um, on the industrial SWIP side, like I said, it's very similar to the construction SWIP side, but you have to have a summary of the activities that you're going to be doing. Um, you have to identify pollutant sources. You have to identify activity or location specific BMPs, and we'll go over BMPs, best management practices here in a second, um, that you're gonna be doing on site to minimize exposure. You have compliance schedules. Um, most of the time when we, you know, when we do a SWIP, we have a, a little one page compliance schedule that says quarterly you have to do this, semi-annually you have to do this, annually you have to do this, and so um, it lays out when you have to do what you have to do. <clears throat> Um, so you don't miss anything, right? So if you miss a, um, a sampling event or whatever, potentially it could be a violation. So you also have to add, to create procedures. So it's not just enough to say we're going to do inspections. You have to say how you're going to do your inspections. You have to say how you're going to respond if you do have a spill. Who are you going to call? Um, how do you make the determination whether or not it's a reportable spill or not? Um, and how are you going to do? Uh, how how do you plan to make those corrective actions whenever you do that, um, or, or say you have a spill, and how are you gonna do your inspections? Um, all the information that you've been gathering up to meet the compliance side of the permit, the endangered species, the historical places, the impaired water bodies, um, all that information has to be documented in the SWIP. So if an inspector were to come back and say, hey, we need to, we think you are discharging to an impaired water body, how did you determine that you're not? Um, and you have to be able to provide that information. Um, one of the bigger things that you'll have to do is you'll have to develop a SWIP team, and that um, assigns roles, um, it assigns activities to roles within a company. It doesn't necessarily have to be by person, so you don't have to say, Joe Schmo is going to be doing this. You can say the EHS manager, whoever fills that role at that time, was gonna be doing the sampling, they're gonna do the upkeep of the binder, they're gonna be you know, um, doing the inspections, that kind of stuff. Um, so you don't necessarily have to do it by person, but you have to do it by at least by title. Nick, this is probably a dumb question. Yeah. How do you know if, if you're, you're already <laughs> laughing, so <laughs> thanks for making me feel better. Um, how, how do you know if, you're, if the water body is impaired or not? Okay, so, um, there is a a 303D list that's the EPA and the state regulatory agencies. Oh, that put I stopped together. reading at 302. That's why. <laughs> oh, one chapter away. Dang. So close. Um, but it, it goes through and it lists. It, I'm not going to say they've done every river segment or every water body, but they've done a handful of them. And probably the ones they, they prioritize. So the, um, I think that the ultimate goal is to get all of them, but they're prioritizing based on industrial activity around the water body, large cities, that kind of stuff. So they will do an evaluation of the of the river segment and figure out what that water body is impaired for. So in some cases, it can be bacteria, it could be E. coli, it could be metals, it could be phosphates, phosphorus, whatever it is. And so they keep a list and they monitor those rivers and they issue, it's, it's horrendously long, um, luckily, they include maps so that you can follow the document. Otherwise, you'd never be able to follow the document um, that show which water bodies are impaired. There's also a couple, um, like Google Earth, I think, has an extension that you can download mm -hmm. um, that links to the 3D list, which is kind of nice. It saves a lot of time um, as long as you are good with directions. I'm not, so. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then, obviously, the last thing is record keeping, making sure you have everything that goes along with the binder, stays with the binder, that kind of stuff. We'll go more into that. Yep, and then similarly, the the construction general permit has many of those same components. I guess I would just focus on um, the biggest thing is obviously to protect your waters downstream, know what they are, know what they're impaired for. If they are impaired for, at least in Minnesota, uh, nutrients um, and things that uh, phosphorus particularly are, are and sediment and TSS are um, associated with, there will be more strict requirements on your BMPs. And so you then you need to check the appendix, make sure that your SWIP is, is meeting those. Um, and the other big consideration is the construction schedule and the phasing. 
and so those are the questions I typically ask contractors when I'm working with them so that I know when are you planning to put down uh, your seed and your what are you going to do over winter what are you going to use for temporary those are things a lot of times design engineers don't think about too much mm -hmm. and sometimes they just don't even include it in their design plans and those are really important to the contractor um, in making sure they stay in compliance with their permit and um, it's it's not even that common that a, a design engineer will come up with several different phases and so you may need to go back to that engineer of record and the contractor may need to do that or the owner and request changes um, as the site is progressing and if there are um, changes to the BMPs that are shown um, those just need to be documented in the SWIP and so again in both cases it's a living document and the EPA expects it to be updated all the time and through the life of the construction. Yeah site. if you ask a client to pull out their SWIP and it's like got dust on it means they probably haven't done much with it and you you are they okay. probably have outdated forms signatures yeah. all that kind of stuff so the, the regulatory agencies really want you to see it marked up that, that proves to them that you're taking care of it exactly so and they'll typically have all kinds of different logs in the back and we can get into that a little bit as far as the inspections mm -hmm. reports the maintenance corrective actions and then amendments to the SWIP so, so like an industrial strip do you need to have it like certified every year or is it, I mean does it expire or I mean how does that so the the industrial stormwater permit has to be certified but that's certified by someone within the company that can delegate um, money more than anything to if something goes wrong um, that they need to be able to delegate the, the money to be able to fix it and 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 signal and signal and certify that they're gonna follow these criteria right so it doesn't have to be done every year um, obviously you have to update it at, you know I think um, I, I think you have 14 days. I don't don't quote me on this, but I think you have like 14 days to update your SWIP. And then if you if it's a major amendment, then obviously you've got a little bit. You know, you you can do it in renditions or whatever. But uh, as long as you're keeping it up to date, that original certification. Now, if that if that person um, leaves that certified the permit um, or certified the SWIP, then you need to have someone else do it. But the person certifying the SWIP can be can be somebody in house as long as they're trained to certify something or well they need that? to be familiar with the SWIP. They need to be familiar with the permit to know whether or not they can meet the requirements okay. um, and then have the money behind it. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to have that cash. Yeah. And then one other difference I know I would like to note on the on stormwater team is that with in the case of the industrial, you say you don't need to name the person, but at least in Minnesota, I know that we are actually expected to list the person's name and their and provide their training, whatever mm -hmm. copy of training that they have. Um, the EPA permit does not list specific certifications a person needs to have. They just expect that that person is trained to do what they're going to be doing, whether they're installing BMPs or they're inspecting them, or if you're sure. doing the design of the SWIP, those are different certifications, which is kind of important to note that. Those people can change, but they you'd like to have those names in there. Yeah. So I, I will say, even though the EPA permit allows you to do it by title, we always recommend you put a specific person's name in there mm -hmm. because that ties ownership to it. And so you can say, Joe, did you do this? Instead of, oh, who's the EHS manager? Okay, that's you know, it just yep. it, that's something that they need to put on their to-do list and make sure that they own it. Absolutely. So, so uh, both construction perm or both permits actually um, have what we call best management practices. Um, they're a little bit different. They kind of they they on the industrial stormwater side, the BMPs are more towards minimizing exposure to what you have on site to stormwater. On the construction side, and you can completely tell me if I'm wrong on this, but the main reason you have BMPs is to keep sediment from coming off your property, right? Exactly. Now, you still need to do, you need to control maintenance chemicals, make sure that they're not coming off site, anything like that, but the main purpose of, you know, the 90%, maybe 90s, a bad example but a large percentage of your time and your BMPs are designed to, to prevent sediment from leaving your site exactly right? yep on the industrial side so we're looking more at the specific activities and the specific chemicals and processes that you have on site and how do you minimize the exposure of those activities and chemicals to stormwater so if you have outdoor storage ideally you want to have it on containment and you want to put it under cover right if you have stuff that, um, obviously the best thing to do is if you can keep it indoors, keep it indoors. We've seen a movement down here in Texas 
of keeping of scrapyards going to large abandoned warehouses and moving their processes indoors because they have such a hard time meeting some of the sampling requirements when they're outdoors. So we've seen a large movement of people of storm of scrap metal yards moving to large warehouses so they can do it all inside. And it's a lot easier to clean. It's a lot easier to dust. You don't have all the, I won't say you won't have all of the tracking on and off the site because it's scrap metal. It's kind of a dirty industry, but, um, but it's a lot, it's a lot further reduced. So, you know, if you can store items on racks that way, when stormwater does flow across your property, it's not impacting, it's not contacting the chemicals or the, the pipes that you have on the, on the pallets. It's, on pallets or on the racks or whatever, that's all it's hitting. Um, you can also channel water around storage areas. So if you know you have a process or a storage area that um, needs frequent attention, we'll put it that way, then you can divert water around it. So it's not it's not impacting as much water. Now, obviously, if you have an area like that, that where, you, where you need the attention, the BMP will be, we need to inspect it every other day or whatever, and make sure that that isn't a problem child for you. And then, you know, we can, you know, we always suggest keeping spill kits around any, anywhere that you have chemical storage, anywhere you're doing maintenance on fleet or equipment. And then secondary containments, if you have outdoor storage of chemicals, it really should be on secondary containments. I know, you know, officially only the oils for SPCCs need to be on containment, but we always recommend that you put outdoor storage on containments. And then in our world, filters such as um, silt fencing, straw wattles, in a last case resort, um, straw, actual straw bales or hay bales um, can be used. The TCQ has come out and said, no, please don't do that. It's clogging up all of our, our all of our check dams and stuff like that. So, um, but the filters are kind of a last resort. Um, there's obviously a place for it. And there's certain types of filters that work on metals. There's certain types that work on, you know, collecting large items like leaves, that kind of stuff. So that's obviously something that you can do as a BMP as well. And then for the construction activities, I kind of lump these into the kind of maybe three or four main categories. Your first line of defense is preventing erosion. So trying to keep the soil from getting in, entrained in water or in the air. So minimizing your disturbed areas. Um, the EPA has added, I think in the more recent permit, it's current today, um, 50 foot buffer between disturbed areas and waters of the state. And so if you're working within that 50 feet and you cannot avoid disturbing that, then you will need to implement additional, like a redundant perimeter control is required in Minnesota. Um, and other states may have other ideas of what to do there, but um, that's that's a very effective way of keeping sediment out of the, the water bodies and also making sure contractors know where they are, they're identified on the plans. Um, but also other uh, ways to prevent erosion are using erosion blankets on steep slopes is a very good idea. Um, and then stabilizing your soils with mulch. There's lots of different kinds of uh, mulch options. Straw is the cheapest, but hydro, seed, hydro seeding and hydro mulching are really uh, popular as long as it's not too cold. Um, so then uh, the second kind of line of defense is your sediment control. So at this point, your BMPs are just uh, designed to catch your sediment because it's moving and you want to keep it on the site. So that's where your perimeter protection of silt fence or you can use logs if it's too if the ground is frozen, you can't get them in the ground. Um, construction exits help to keep tracking um, to a minimum onto paved areas and inlet protection is going to catch sediment for it, it falls into a storm sewer system. Um, and then Pollution prevention is, I'm not even going to get too much into that because it's really similar to the industrial, um, but just if you're storing chemicals outside, having spill kits out there. The one the big thing um, with construction is obviously concrete washout areas need to be identified. So uh, making sure the contractor knows where those are. And then uh, temporary sediment basins are, uh, are required um, and keeping those dewatered or so that they're not overflowing is really important. So um, that's basically the gist of the most of the BMPs that we use, but there is a very long list. So if you want to see them all, I can get that for you. <laughs>
Okay, so this is just an example of what we have seen down here. Um, this is actually a site that we have up near Oklahoma. And for a long time, anytime they got a good rain, the erosion from further upstream would come down and it would clog up their sample port, right? So, <coughs> excuse me. So they wouldn't be able to get a sample or it was flooding their, we'll call this a retainment ditch or whatever it was. Um, but what we did is we actually put down erosion control blankets. So uh, what those do is it keeps the soil in place while the, the while the vegetation is growing through. And so the vegetation acts as a filter. And then also we put these check dams in there that as the water flows through the vegetation, it slows it down. It slows it down even further getting through these rip rip wrap check dams and then the sediment falls out of the water. So by the time you get down to the, the discharge point, you have a, a pretty good little clean sample area. And then this, these are just ideas to help you minimize exposure. Obviously, in the world of, of minimizing exposure, the more permanent solution that you have, like a building or a lean-to, an awning, something like that, is going to be preferred. Um, you don't, you're not going to have the, the upkeep that you do with something temporary. But you can have temporary storage, like over here on the left, um, that would keep water or wind-blown materials from exposing to the storm water. And you can also have over here on the right, we have temporary berming um, to keep water or direct water away from areas where you have chemical storage. And then here, here's more permanent solutions, something like curbing. Curbing, it can be used to keep water where you want it to go or keep it away from areas that you don't want it to go. So it's very valuable in that respect. And then obviously the more permanent awning and secondary containments. One, if you have a permanent solution, um, it you have ownership of it, you've invested the capital expenditure, so um, you want to keep it clean, you want to keep it nice and um, nice for management, and then also it's just, it's going to last you longer. Okay, so uh, again, this is something that's fairly similar between the two permits. Um, not necessarily, like, I think the construction SWIP, you have a couple more certifications or inspection type um, trainings that you have to go to on the front end. But uh, from the from the SWIP training material, um, the EPA permit outlines it very clear. It says you have to cover this, you have to cover this, you have to cover this. And it's actually a pretty long list. So it's not included, it's just referenced. Um, but the permit outlines what this is. So every year you have to train who um, anyone that has the potential to impact stormwater. So that's forklift drivers that go between buildings, that's maintenance crew that does you know, repairs on equipment that can't come indoors. Um, it, it, generally speaking, we always recommend that you train everyone because even if like that one day a year, you ask some guy to take the trash out, he's now impacting stormwater. But um, so we, we recommend that you do it. However, if you are gonna do it on a area by area or role by role, position by position type training, then you need to make sure you have documentation as to why you aren't training them. And W and Braun is is capable of training. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we give the staff. annual training quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. And I'll just note for um, for what I guess I'm doing is inspections and design. It's important to for me to go and figure out what are the training requirements for that state. So checking mm -hmm. with the state because just because here in Minnesota, I mean, it's great that I have you know CPESC here, but or you know, but maybe they don't care over there. So, um, and maybe they don't have a CPESC requirement at all. So, um, things like that it's, are important to look into before you start sending inspectors out and then talking with your clients about what you can do. So. Mm. <clears throat> Okay, so this is one of the sampling is one of those areas where the construction general permit gets off. Um, I'm going to say easy, even though um, that's not the case. But um, on the industrial side, you have sampling that you have to do. You have benchmark sampling, which is done quarterly according to the EPA permit. Obviously, in certain in other states, it's a little bit different. I know in Texas, it's quarterly, <coughs> but those are those are determined by your sector, right? And so it, the good thing about benchmarks is that if you exceed the benchmark at your outfalls, so let me go back just one second and say that you have to collect these samples at designated outfalls. And the outfalls that you determine when you're developing your SWIP are reported to the EPA or the state agency that says, this is where my outfall is. And so if you change those, you have to submit a notice of change and say, this is now where my outfall is, or now I have three outfalls or whatever it is. So you collect your sample, you analyze it for benchmarks, and that's normally some metals and something like TSS and BOD, something like that, right? And when you do that, if you exceed one of the benchmark values that um, you're given, 
um, then it's not a violation of the permit. It is a, an indicator that something you're doing isn't working right. Either your BMPs are inadequate, they're installed incorrectly, or you just need to find something else to do completely, right? So um, it's, not a, it's not a violation, it's an indicator that you need to improve on something, right? So you have to evaluate that whenever you get your benchmark samples. On the EPA side of things, if you have, and if you collect a year's worth of benchmarks and you have an average benchmark over the benchmark value, so if, if, the, if you get an average over four, then over four quarters, then you have to let the EPA know. Um, we don't have that requirement here in Texas. Um, we do have benchmark monitoring requirements, um, a report you have to report, but we only do it semi-annually, and so it's a little bit different. But if you have that overall average um, that's exceeding the benchmarks, then you um, then you have to let the EPA know. Um, on the annual hazardous metals or the numeric effluent monitoring, that's again, that's per sector, at least in the EPA world, and um, that's once a year, annual, right? And if you do exceed those numbers, um, you have to let the EPA know as well. So it's one of those where um, the the benchmark values are really low, that's what they want you to shoot for, and the hazardous metals limits, or the effluent limits are quite a bit higher. So hopefully, if you do have problems, you're hanging out in the, that benchmark area, and you never get to that hazardous metals area. But you also have to, so say you discharge into an impaired water body, or say you have chemicals that um, an imp a, a water is impaired for, you have to do that monitoring, and whenever you put that on your NOI, the EPA will actually um, contact you and make sure you understand what you have to do. You have to do that. And if you're trying to prove you don't have those chemicals, then you submit that data to them at their frequency until they say, okay, yeah, no, we believe you. And then obviously the states and tribal lands can request you to do anything they want to. And I'll just say really briefly that primarily there is no sampling required under the general construction permit, but in rare cases like New Hampshire, I found in the state of Washington and and in Idaho, you can uh, sometimes have turbidity sampling requirements, especially in the tribal lands. Um, they have the ability under the EPA permit to ask for that. Um, so you would be measuring NTUs. So. And turbidity means? <laughs> so that's the measure to the degree of the degree to which water loses transparency, um, which then indicates the presence of suspended particulates. So it's kind of like your TSS measurement. So the darker the water, um, the harder it is to see through it, and that's a way to measure that, and obviously your water quality is poor if you can't see through it, and then fish can't breathe, and the whole process, ah. so. It's three things. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm, okay. not, I'm not maxed out. <laughs> so the, uh, this, this actually, if you look at the EPA permit, this actually falls under the sampling requirements, but it's called quarterly visual monitoring. And basically what you do is you go to each one of your outfalls and you collect a sample. You don't send it in for analysis, but you take a visual look at what it looks like. Does it have an odor? Does it have a color to it? Does it have floating solids? Does it have suspended solids? Does it have um, uh, a, a color or you know a foam to it? So you shake it up and see if the foam developed. Does it have a sheen? So it's not something that you have to send off to a lab, but you have to do it quarterly and you have to document it. And so you can see here, this is kind of the template form that we use here. Very good. Yeah, it's not hard to do, it just, you have to get wet. And so that's tough. <laughs> For the inspections, like I said, the permit has to outline what you have, to, or how you're going to do your inspections. So yeah, and on the industrial side, you have quarterly inspections. And then after you do those four quarterly inspections, you have an annual report to the EPA that says, here's a, sum, uh, you know, here's a summary of my analytical results, my quarterly visual monitoring, my inspections, what did you observe over and over again, and how did you fix it? Um, so that's something that you have to do. And then ideally, in an, um, if you can, I know it's hard to plan sometimes, but if you're supposed to shoot for doing one during a rain event, one of the quarterly inspections. And on the construction side, inspections are a very big deal. Uh, routine inspections are required, EPA requires them to occur a minimum of once every seven calendar days or once every 14 days and within 24 hours of the occurrence of a quarter inch storm event or greater or the occurrence of a snow melt that could cause um, stormwater to, to discharge from the site. And then states are and many times do um, 
uh, able to make that more stringent or offer, you know, and or statements in my misery, there are several of them I've noticed. So, um, and then you can also increase inspection frequencies for sites that are discharging to sensitive waters. So it's important to check with your state and um, at a minimum the EPA for what's needed on those sites, which can change for winter conditions as well. And um, so when you, when you guys are talking about inspections, are you automatically including sampling or is that no, so Separate. sampling is completely something different. So an inspection is just a visual inspection of what you see at the, you know, kind of like a, a time, a photograph in time. What you see at the site, what's going on, and what you do. The sampling is something where you go out and collect water and submit it to a lab. Okay. So reporting, again, this is one of those areas where the construction soap gets off. I'm going to say easy, but um, the good thing is, is with the EPA permits, most all, I mean, all the reporting is done with NetDMR. Um, I know here in Texas, we're waiting for our net version of NetDMR to work. Um, we were supposed to be able to do all of this back in 2016, and we're still waiting on it. Um, but we've had hurricanes and tornadoes that the DCQ has been dealing with, probably a little bit more important. So, um, so in the meantime, here in Texas, still do all your reporting um, online unless you have sector specific. Uh, benchmarks, and then you can submit those for those few criteria that, that meet those re re meet that requirement. Um, but you have to submit your annual report within or by January 21st of the next year, so that covers the full year before it. And then if you have a 20 or if you have a non-compliance that may endanger health or the environment, you have to let them know within 24 days, and you can do that online. Um, if you have to let them know if there's changes. Um, again, you do that online. So in, in Texas, we have the NOC forms, piece of cake. You submit it. Here, you do it online, and um, I'm guessing it's even easier since it's online, but I um, haven't done it. And then if you have an anticipated noncompliance, so say you you have a one-off event and you know something is going to go, you have you think you have the potential for something to go horribly wrong, you need to let them know, and, and they can account for it. And then obviously, re reportable spills. That's, that's a requirement in SPCC. It's a requirement in SWIP. So if you have a spill, you need to let them know. As well. And so the report for non-compliances, which may endanger health, you said 24 days. I think you meant 24 I'm hours. I'm sorry. Yes, 24 hours. Okay. And then you have a follow-up report after 48 hours that this – Yes. <laughs> I, like, I, I like, do not want to what, get What, what that, happened yeah. there? Well, the guy said 24 <laughs> days, and we're only at 12, so we're good. So, and yeah. Thank you for the clarification. All right. And on the, um, the general permit for construction, emergency spills are considered the toxic or hazardous substances, and you want to uh, report that to National Response Center for the EPA or if you have a state duty officer. So check your permit on that, and your SWIP should, should list that phone right. number yeah. that yeah. is required. Okay. Um, so luckily, luckily um, for me and Amanda more than anything, because Lance is shooting his daggers, um, <laughs> the last, this is the last content slide, right? So um, the record keeping portion of SWIP is probably the most important thing you can do. Um, here in Texas, um, the biggest piece of documentation that you can that you can keep outside of the stuff you've already done for your NOI, right, is the rain gauge log. So if you are, so say you have the requirement to do quarterly visual monitoring, and you have a rain gauge log that shows that you know there were multiple times for you to get a a sample, then you should have gotten that sample. You just didn't do it. But if you didn't get that sample and you have a rain gauge log that's kept up to date and accurate and shows that there was no rain event during that quarter, then it's more or less your get out of jail free card. You know, I and mean, I, I say that loosely, but um, it 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 would it it looks a lot better if you have that documentation rain gauge log, right? So um, you want to keep all your, doc all your documentation on site. You want to keep it in the binder. We always recommend, um, even though the, you know, the, the permit says you have to keep it for three years, we always recommend keeping at least the last permit cycle, so five years mm -hmm. um, worth. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in the exact same spot as your current binder. It might actually get confusing, but you have to keep it and maybe you know, put it in storage or something like that. But you want to make sure you keep your analytical results, all copies of the signed inspections. I know when we do inspections here, we send, we send our copy with our signature on it, and then the signature authority has to sign it on their end, and we don't always get a copy of that, but they need to make sure that that signed copy stays on site. And then obviously you have duty to um, keep up your revision log. So say you do have a change and you move 
location of storage or whatever it is. You need to document that on your map, document it in your stormwater pollution prevention plan, and then also keep a log of it. Same thing if you have reportable spills, you need to keep a log of it. It needs to be updated. Here in Texas, we do it quarterly. Um, and then training log, whenever you do your training for the year, make sure you have everyone sign in. If no one signs in, it's like you never did it. So uh, make sure that you keep all that um, yep. and in place. The CGP's got the corrective action logs. Uh, that need, Those are really important. The SWIP amendments, uh, the grading and stabilization activities are really helpful for the inspectors to know when uh, work has been done because they may come up to the site and they seeded yesterday, but it's hard to tell. So those are really helpful. And then training logs and inspection reports should all be kept in the binder. So these are just some examples of some of the um, documentation you have to keep. Uh, SWIP amendment log shows what amendment number it is you know, a description of what happened or what's changing, the date of it, and then um, who's responsible for it. And then obviously a reportable spill log, say you have a spill, what spilled, how much spilled, um, how it happened, what you did, and then who all you notified. And then just for fun, we put it, put in some slides of stuff that you, we hope you don't see very often out in your facilities. Obviously the silt fencing is inadequate. You probably had a, should have a retention or detention bond out there. Um, don't dump, we can't decide if that's a Folgers cup or paint. Looks to me like a paint cup <laughs> for when you're up on a ladder. And then obviously someone downstream of this facility here on the, on the bottom left um, isn't doing what they need to be doing upstream. It's inundating the, the, the water with sediment. And then I don't think that little straw waddle there is going to do much for that, the amount of water that's barreling down that pipe. And then this is just a, we could, we could play games with this one for a while. So if you want to, you know, on the little chat thing, tell us everything that's wrong. And if you get the most of them correctly, then we'll give, give you a prize or something. Yeah, like that. we can do that. <laughs> You get to be the next presenter on the next. Uh, yeah, that's right. Down the road. <laughs> so, this is the the slide here is just kind of um, explains where we've expanded to uh, WNM and Braun. That's uh, that's our footprint. Uh, we're kind of all over uh, the Midwest, and we're really excited about that. Um, and so you're going to be seeing, we're going to be uh, doing joining forces much more on these uh, webinars. Actually, um, for the next. Next year, I think we all we have every webinar is actually going to be uh, co-represented by WNM Braun. We're one team, but it's going but it's just WNM is resources. generally Texas, yeah. and then and then it, we have to get uh, efficient on the other regulations in the other states. So there's uh, all the other environmental services that we do in the in these states, full service as usual, and then. Uh, so, and there's the contact information for our two experts, Amanda and Nick. Thank you guys for for doing this, Nick. Thank you for it being the third time. I will I'll have you. <laughs> I will be safe to say that you will not be a part of our webinars for the remainder of the year because this Thanks. is the last one that we're doing actually this year. So, but if you have any questions, uh, there's their contact information. Um, you can also uh, send the email. That, you're going to get an email uh, later today or tomorrow. You can also uh, reply to that and I can get those questions to them. Our next webinar is actually in January and it's going to be Lessen the Burden, Streamlining Environmental Compliance Through Program in Improvements. And so Jennifer Adams, Vanessa Coleman, and Sarah Biblioni Sambolin is going to be, I did that pretty B. good. Sarah or B. Sarah B. Yeah. That's right. They're going to be <laughs> discussing how to create and implement successful compliance programs. And so that's in January 23rd. Thank you guys all. We did go over a little bit of time, and that's why I was shooting daggers at, at mainly Nick because Amanda's too nice. And I, hope, and I don't want her to be mad at me. But uh, we generally like to keep them under an hour, but this one had such good information, and uh, so we wanted to keep it going. So thank you guys again for joining us. Thank you. It was fun. And have a great Thanksgiving and holiday. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.